I'll introduce you to Becky S. My name is Becky and I'm alcoholic. Hi, First off, I'd like to thank um, the committee to, um, for having me. Um, it was a humbling experience. And never in my life would I have thought that I'd be standing in front of, I don't know how many is here, but all you people <laughs> sharing my story. But here we go. Um, so my sobriety date is September. 27th of 2018 um, and that's only by God's grace having a good sponsor and working the program of this uh, beautiful program here Alcoholics Anonymous that I stand before you sober so um, I'd like to begin um, with just a moment of silence and I'd like to um, each of us just to invite God into the room the God of your understanding. Thank you. All right. Well, I was born in Greensburg, Indiana, and um, my parents, um, they had me, right? I was born. Um, <laughs> No, but I, I lived with my mother and my father until I was five, until they divorced. Um, and um, at five years old, um, you know, I remember the day that my dad left. And um, looking back on that now, I really do believe that that was the beginning of the, the root problems. You know, I had, um, you know, a lot of abandonment issues. Um, when I was around seven, my... My mother remarried, and um, my stepfather became my father, and he still today is, you know, my father figure. Um, during my childhood, you know, there was, um, I had a lot of uh, dysfunction, I would say, looking back on that now. There was a lot of um, uh, parties on the weekends, um, you know, just, it was that lifestyle, you know, my, my mom worked hard, she worked at night, and on the weekends they partied. Um, and since my mother worked second shift, you know, I became the mom at a really young age to my younger siblings. Um, you know, helping with their homework, making sure they had dinner, and that made me grow up really quick. But on the weekends I can remember, you know, just kind of looking and observing the adults and the, the kind of fun they were having, and there was a part of me that wondered what that fun was all about. And I think I remember, like, my first drink. My first real drink was probably after my parents had divorced, which I was, I was going to my father, my real dad's. And I remember just randomly, like, taking beer out of his refrigerator. And I'd go to the bathroom, and I'd drink it really fast. And I was probably, like, 11. And I don't know why I did that. You know, I don't know why I felt that that was an escape. Um, I know today why I was, you know, I was trying to feel, I think. Um, so time went on um, into my, um, you know, adolescent years. And I was, I can, um, I can remember one time uh, that alone feeling that we all kind of can relate with, um, or most of us, I know I can, uh, being on the playground and I was swinging. And I could see kids playing, and um, I, was I was alone. And I remember this group of girls came walking over to me, and they were like the high school, they were like, not high school, they were, we were like sixth graders. And um, they asked me if I wanted to come play with them. And I was like, no, I think I'll stay right here. I just didn't really feel like I w um, belonged with them. I didn't feel like I belonged um, with the other kids. So a lot of times I would, you know, decline the invitation and, you know, just, you know, be by myself. You know, as I grew into the high school years, um, I kind of still felt the same way, you know, just not knowing where I quite fit. You know, I was kind of like a friend of everybody, 
um, didn't really have a clique that I was involved in. Um, but I know now that that was the, uh, that was that, the root of my problem all along was, you know, I just felt different, right? Um, and I think I was about 15, and I was always the people pleaser of all the kids. So mom was working second, and uh, I would be the, the helper, of course. So I'd hurry up and make sure everything was all perfect for, with, for mom when she got home. And I was remember sweeping the floor, and I just all of a sudden thought, I'm going to have some gin. And I remember my mom kept minimal bottles of alcohol in the kitchen, and I poured a tumbler of gin like this tall. And I remember drinking that down and the feeling I got, and I called a boy on the phone, and I was sweeping the floor, and, you know, I was just on cloud nine. Um, I think that was the first real, like, experience where I felt like I was, I was something, right? I was no longer that awkward kid. I was no longer, you know, alone because I had that. I had that feeling within me. It filled some sort of hole. So as time went on and I, you know, started through my high school years, um, I became that weekend drinker. You know, every time I could get up my hands on it, I'd had older friends that would get, give it to me on the weekends. Um, go to campfires, you know, I'd always have beer. I'd go into the liquor stores and pretend that I was old enough to buy it. Um, and then one day I got caught doing that. And um, that was my first encounter with the law. And that was when I was almost 19. And um, I had to go pay a fine. And I think I had to do some, like, 10 hours of community service, like painting stuff at the YMCA. So um, time went on. I kept, didn't change my behavior. Um, I was coming home from a campfire, second encounter with the police. They pulled me over, asked me if I'd been drinking. Um, and I was not quite, I was still, I was 19 at this time. And they give me the option of pouring my beer out and, or going home, or pouring my beer out, going home, or keeping it and going to jail. So obviously I pulled my, poured my beer out. So, you know, little slaps on the hands, right? So uh, time went on, you know, I was drinking more and more, and it was all social, hasn't, you know, really caused me any problems yet. Um, I found myself um, at age 22 expecting, and um, I ended up having a little girl, her, um, one of the bright lights in my life, and um, after that, a year, I got married. I got married to a man that our relationship revolved around the cooler of beer, and that's what was our common bond. So that all worked for a while, and um, then my behavior really started to change. Um, I was drinking more and more. I was making poor decisions. Um, I was, you know, trying to become somebody I wasn't in the midst of all this, and um, I found myself on a Tuesday morning feeling really empty and something told me to call the 800 number um, if you wanted help, you know, for a drinking problem. And that was in 2004 and I called and the lady on the other end of the line, her name was Liz. And she told me that there was a solution and that she asked me if I could not drink anymore the rest of that day. But this was Tuesday morning. I was sitting on my bedroom floor and I was already drinking beer. And um, that, that evening I was in a, de a detox center. My mom and her had collaborated and got me some help. So I went through this 30-day um, rehab and... Um, I came out and I started going to meetings. She became my sponsor. And um, I know now, looking back on that, I wasn't doing the work. I wasn't doing um, what was suggested. I was just kind of going through the motions. Um, so I relapsed and I relapsed and I relapsed again. 
And I remember um, I went to a St. Morris meeting, which is a little town outside of our town of Greensburg, and um, I was getting another start over token, and she stood up to give me my token. She goes, why don't you just use the one I just gave you? And that was just a few, like maybe two weeks before that. So, you know, um, after that, um, after that start over token, I ended up staying sober for just a little over a year. And um, again, I was just going through the motions. I wasn't really taking this thing serious. So um, I actually got into a relationship in the midst of all that. And it was, it wasn't a good thing for either of us. After that, I ended up um, getting my first DUI. You know, so when I first came into this program, I hadn't been in any trouble except those two slaps on the, the wrist that I had told you about. But after coming to this program and seeing, seeing that it does work, I just wasn't willing to surrender. So, first DUI. I was living in my parents' basement. I had lost my job. This all happened within like maybe like 45 days. Loss of job, first DUI, living in my parents' basement. Lost it all, right? So I had lost my license for I think the 90 days and then after that um, I went back to my ex-husband. Um, I forgot to say that I got a divorce and all that. But, um, <laughs> but um, I went back to my ex-husband where I knew and I, I wouldn't be able to tell you this three years ago, or, but I know today that I went back there because I could get my way and I could manipulate my way into staying an active alcoholic. So I stayed there, and I um, continued those poor behaviors that I, you know, I had originally you know, wanted to stop drinking for you know, back in 2004. But in the midst of all that, you know, I just kept getting more miserable and more miserable more sick and more sick, you know, drinking in the morning occasionally, especially on Saturday morning or Sunday morning while I was cleaning my house, which goes back to that first story I told you. So, you know, I had this cycle. I had this cycle of um, destruction. And um, so in the midst of these years, um, being in this uh, non-marriage uh, relationship with my ex-husband, I ended up with my second DUI. Ended up doing two weeks of community service, um, like community work release. Um, so basically jail while I worked. And I come out of there and still unable to surrender. And I ended up going to a concert that night. And um, looking back on that, I just, I don't even know what I was thinking. I wasn't thinking. So I continued this cycle. You know, it was the cycle of, okay, I'm going to quit for a while. I quit for like three months, um, and then I'd start back up. But during this cycle of destruction, this time and time again, over and over and over, it was the same thing over and over, but it got worse each time. I, wanted, I want to, to, as I go through my timeline, see where AA was where for me the, the entire time. You know, I have really good close friends in this program. One of them bailed me out of jail, my second DUI. Um, you know, I've stayed in close contact with, with uh, my garden angel, I call her now, Liz, um, throughout all those years of um, not attending AA. You know, but it came to a point where um, I was really, really sick. And I remember one of the last conversations I had on the phone, because there wasn't very many days that I went when I didn't talk to her. And um, she asked me how I was doing, and I said, I'm fine. We all know what that means, right? And I tell her that all the time, and she knew I wasn't. So it was Thanksgiving of 2017, and I was supposed to go to my mother's. I was out all night. I didn't know how I got home. It was just the same thing, same story. My family's mad at me. And um, things got rough at the house, and I ended up leaving again. So I got a little house in town. I still had my job. I don't know how. And um, at this point, I had been at this job for like 11 years. And um, they were definitely my family. 
as I moved out of my, my, my home and into this small little house, I thought, you know what? I've got rid of all that baggage now. I'm not going to have to worry about listen to anybody you know I'm not going to be able to I'm not going to be upsetting everybody every day I'm just gonna I'll be able to do this I'll be able to do this life and I remember I moved into that little house and that was probably the worst thing I ever could have done for my alcoholism because I had no accountability my son wasn't pouring my bottles out (laughs) and I was drunk every day it escalated and escalated and that was in November. November, by April of the next year, I lost my job of 11 years. I got another DUI the next month. And I lost the whole month of June. I don't even remember June. But this program was here for me. Liz worked with my mom again, and I got into a detox. And I stayed there for a few days, and I got out. And I stayed sober. I started going back to meetings. I kind of had a little glimpse of hope. I stayed sober for one day shy of two months. I was almost ready for a 60-day token. And on a Thursday night, I drove to Shelbyville, and I started drinking again. Why? I know why now, because I had a soul sickness. And um, Julie told me that I'm not allowed to say, and um, so I'm going to try not to say, and um, too many times. So, (sighs) thank you. (laughs) I had some in my big book. So the cycle started what again, all over again, right? And that was at the end of August of 2018. And I lost another month, September. I don't remember September. I remember that the day before my daughter's birthday, I decided I was going back to rehab. So I booked a flight to Florida, and I'm going to rehab. And uh, I get down there. This nice man picks me up at the airport. I'm, t- I'm one day out of detox. I'm still shaking. And I get down there, and I'm in the, the, you know, they're checking me in, and they come up to me, and they say, um, we're not gonna, we don't take your insurance. And I'm like, well, I don't have $30,000, right? And um, so I call my mom, um, my mom and my friend, and I'm like, I guess I'm just going to make a vacation out of this as I'm down here. So I got an Uber, and I found the a cute little place on the beach, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to make a vacation out of it. I'm, gonna, I'm here. I might as well stay. You know, that's just what I need. I wasn't there 24. I wasn't even there a day. It was, it was like a few hours, and I was, um, I was already drunk. But to back up, when I was checking into this hotel, this lady at the register, she was like, are you okay? And I said, yeah. I said, I'm actually, you know, I came down here to go to rehab, and you know, like it would, they wouldn't take my insurance. <laughs> and she looks at me and she goes, I'm in recovery. And I was like, oh my gosh. I said, well, maybe we can go to a meeting like while I'm here. I didn't go to a meeting while I was there. I walked down to the next, wherever it was, and I started drinking Fireball. Fireball was my last drink, and I still can't stand the smell of a cinnamon disc. So... That, that, that first drink that night, after being out of the detox for a day and a half or whatever it was, I was still in the fog from that one. So 14 days of another horrific cycle. Um, I don't really remember much went on down there. Um, all I know is I pretended that I was okay through pictures and through... Um, text messages and things like that. I know my family um, knew something was up. My friends knew something was up. And um, I don't know how many days it was in, but I ended up uh, becoming unresponsive in my hotel room the day I was supposed to be flown home. 
and I was taken to a facility and um, gave, I was given um, fluids and released, released to a city that I, I didn't have anything. The EMS, everything was in my hotel room and um, I didn't have a phone, I didn't have anything. But I had met this man, um, his name is David, and he is also one of the angels in my life, um, that got me, um, got a hold of my family, and they ended up finding me. Um, through all this, um, I'm wandering around this hospital, I'm walking, I'm walking outside, and I'm shaking, you know, I asked them for a blanket, I had nothing, I had nothing, the, sh the clothes on my back. And um, so the, this, I remember seeing this man walking up towards me, this small black man, and he asked me if I was okay, and I said no, and I kind of told him what was going on, and he was like, well, if you want, you can come sleep on my couch tonight. And I was like, oh, God, please don't let him be a serial killer. But he ended up being in one of my angels. I know he was. I can still see his face. I don't even remember his name. But long story short, I got back to Indiana. This man named David got a hold of my family. He got me to the airport. And I got home on the, uh, the 28th of September, 2018. And I had to do something different. No, it was not the 28th. Yes, it was the 28th. So um, my family pushed me into doing something because what I was doing was not working. So I ended up moving into a recovery house there in our town, Speranza House, which there's some of those beautiful women here that are residents right now are here. And, uh, you know, I was so ashamed. Like, what? How did I get here, right? How did I get here? I got here because I'm an alcoholic. So I moved myself into, uh, my sister took me to the Speranza house. I was so mad. I didn't want to see, be seen in that white van. Oh my gosh, I didn't want to be in that white van. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm Becky, you know, I've, I'm, you know, I'm a professional, you know, I, I shouldn't be in the Speranza house. So what do we have to do? We have to go to a meeting that Friday night. I moved in on a Wednesday and I knew who's gonna be at that meeting, all those same faces. Well, I walked down the steps of the church there in town, um, which is my home group, Friday Night Beginners group. And I walk around the corner and there's some faces there. And that gave me some hope. That gave me some hope. So during the stay at the Speranza house, I got busy, you know. I got busy in recovery. And um, I got busy. I got busy getting to know me. I had no clue who I was. So I moved in there, and I stayed there for about um, 10 months. And um, there, what I did is I learned that it's okay to be an alcoholic. It's what we do about it. So I started working with my sponsor. We went through the steps. And, um, you know, I started to do a little bit of healing, a little bit of healing. I got another job in the same profession. I work in the dental field. Um, and I didn't think anybody would ever want to hire me again. You know, today, you know, I look back and I think that uh, one of the worst things, I'm stealing this from one of my favorite speakers, by the way, one of the worst things that could ever happen to me was to become alcoholic and have to go to some place like Alcoholics Anonymous. But today, I know that it is the most beautiful thing in my life is that I became alcoholic and I have the privilege to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. So, through there, um, while I was at the Speranza house, how are we on time? Okay. Whoa. So through there, um, you know, I began to, uh, I, get, I began to know me. I began to form this relationship with this presence inside of me that I know what it is now. 
you know, looking back on all those years of all those cycles of destruction, you know, I know now that those little glimpses of hope that I had was God trying to work in my life. And, um, you know, today I have a personal, beautiful relationship with God. I mean, he dwells within me. And he creates a light within me today that I'm now able to share with other people. I'm, a, I'm able to share my experience, strength, and hope. You know, I get the privilege to um, sponsor a couple girls, work with them, working through the steps with them. You know, I've had a handful but not all of them have um, proceeded with finishing it up. And you know what? I'll be here when they're ready. Um, I, I thought um, when, when I was asked to do this lead, this talk, that um, it was because Phil knew that he was the, I was the only person that had burned my life down so many times. And I'm still here standing. I mean, I, there's no way I should have survived some of that stuff. So, um, you know, today, you know, I, I, attend, as, I, attend, I attend meetings, you know. I haven't worked with my sponsor in a while, but I think, you know, it's um, probably time. I love working steps with the girls. Um, you know, I have friendships today, like true friendships. True friendships that I, I can love people without anything in return. And, um, you know, today I can be that true friend. You know, today I can, um, I can go to work and not have the shakes. You know, you don't want me working on your teeth when I have shaky hands, do you? So I'm grateful. Today I choose to walk with a grateful heart. You know, sobriety has given me so many gifts. Like, I don't have enough time to tell you all that. But um, for the one thing that I can say is that uh, I'm going to read something. I told myself I wasn't going to prepare for this. So as I was walking in here, um, I looked down, I stuck this in my book, and I found a feather. So a feather means that somebody's looking over me. It's my guardian angel. So I stuck it in this book where I had this marker. I'm going to try to read this. We pocket our pride and we go with it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of our past. Once we have taken the step with holding nothing, we are delighted. We came, we came to look the world in the eye. We, we be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel that on, we are on the broad highway, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. And that's exactly how most days of my life feel today. today. And um, I like to share this story of when I feel like I had my first experience with having, you know, a spiritual experience. I was sitting in the small room at the Presbyterian Church, and we were talk, you know, we were having the meeting. And this one of the members was sitting in, up against the wall, and he started to glow. And I was like, what's going on? And I got this feeling within me, and I, I, I kind of looked away, and I looked back up, and he started to glow again. And I was like, that was my first feeling of this presence within me, you know? And I'm going to trust that. That is God working within me. And I listened to that voice within today. You know, that, that surrender, I love that I'm able to surrender. You know, in addition to surrendering to alcohol, you know, I have to surrender to other things. You know, I've struggled off and on with an eating problem throughout my life. I can, I can put that towards, you know, this program and the surrender towards that. You know, I was a closet vapor. 
Nobody knew that, right? Maybe a handful of you. I got rid of that using this program. You know, thy will be done. Please remove me of the bondage of self. So there's, this program works, you know. You don't have to be an alcoholic to have, like, let this program work for you. I'm a true, I'm a, I'm a believer of that. So um, I have experienced so many things that um, have been spiritual to me. You know, um, I love I love giving to this program. You know, I am, I'll just kind of run through the, some of the things that I'm doing. I don't know if that, do we do that? Um, I have been asked to be the treasurer for my home group. So I do that. And I'm the intergroup rep for our home group, which is the Friday Night Beginners Group in Greensburg, Indiana. And um, I, I, um, I do what I can when I'm asked. And I don't think I've ever even said no. Um, so I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, and I think I'm going to keep getting what I'm getting. Um, outside of this program, I, um, I have rebuilt relationships with my family, especially my sister, my sister and my kids. And uh, for that, I'm forever grateful. And um, I'm going to close with um, talking about forgiveness. You know, I true, I, I believe full heartedly that forgiveness is the pathway to peace. And I remember when I first sat down with Julie, my sponsor, and we were going through my fifth step, you know, this time around. And, man, I was still blaming. It was everybody else's fault, right? Um, and she told me, she goes, you just need to pray for them. Pray for the people that I was holding, you know, resentments against. And that's what I started doing. I started praying for my ex-husband. You know, I started praying for um, feeling victimized by people, you know. And since then, that forgiveness has healed me from having those resentments. So forgiveness to me is very much healing. And um, I have to forgive in order to be forgiven. And um, this program has also blessed me with the ability to have a healthy relationship today. And uh, I never ever thought that was possible, you know. And I feel like we are um, letting God guide us and staying out of the way and just like letting it unfold. And for that, I'm forever grateful. <sighs> hmm. And I think I'm about done. And I'd like to, I steal a lot of things from Bob Darrell. He's one of my favorite speakers. And he uses this little poem sometimes in his, in his um, talks. I am the place where God shines through. He and I are one, not two. I need not to worry, fret, or plan. He wants me here and as I am. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Becky. If you'd help me uh, close this meeting, just stay in place and uh, hold hands if you wish, and we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.